Uh, hello, welcome to the large cap, the show we talk about the trading technology and the future of the crypto market. Uh, my name is Eugene Chang. I'm the head of institutions at the Bybit. Uh, today with us is uh, Nik uh, Nikita Fadif, uh, who is uh, running a uh, digital uh, quant crypto digital funds for the Fesnara Digital. Um, and also joining us is Benjo, who is our founder and the CEO at the Bybit. The men have a plan and uh, try to ship in the how people trading crypto in the future. Uh, before we start, Nikita, would you mind just give us a little bit introduction about Fesnara Digital and also yourself? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you very much for having me. Um, so uh, I guess uh, very quickly, um, I started trading crypto in 2017. Uh, I was in university then, um, so took a um, rather entrepreneurial approach. Uh, so created a team uh, to build out uh, strategies uh, for crypto. Uh, and so then we we're quite fortunate to strike uh, a, a deal uh, with Fasanara Capital to essentially um, build and launch uh, an institutional focused uh, quant crypto fund uh, in 2018. It was a decently novel idea. Uh, and um, me and my partners, uh, we started working, working on it. Uh, and the approach was from day one to cater to institutions whenever they're ready to deploy. Um, it's been the mantra that, you know, institutions are coming, 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 they're always coming. Uh, and so we wanted to be uh, somewhat um, a bridge uh, for them uh, to get exposure to the space uh, and pursue diversified market neutral strategies with very little volatility uh, that are harnessing the inefficiencies uh, of the uh, asset class. And so in my role, uh, I'm looking after uh, the trading uh, research and um, some business development initiatives. So yeah, so so basically the Fasanara Digital that's your first job from the college. Yeah, yeah. How long has it yeah, been? That, that... Well, five years now. Um, so it was uh, quite 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 a journey. Five years now. Oh, okay. And where are you guys uh, located? So we're based in London. Um, so the firm is quite established. Uh, so when we joined, it was still uh, quite small, uh, but kind of running already for quite a few years. And since then, we've seen like a tremendous growth on all sides of the business. So right now we run about $4 billion firm wide, around 200 people, lots of different strategies, ideas, a uh, few offices here and there. So it's been uh, quite quite nice time. And, and first we, we is like a purely crypto focused company no no not really so uh for is just yeah traditional uh hedge fund you could say um so we used to have uh, some uh equity uh strategies uh but then we switched the uh, focus uh, to alternative credit so uh trade financing uh sme lending and things like that uh and uh yeah i guess we're uh, quite a pioneer uh, in that segment of the market uh, certainly one of the largest out there uh, and crypto has been just a small uh, sleeve that we're incubating but then over the years it progressively you know started to uh, to do very well uh, and capture uh, quite a bit of spotlight I'm quite interested to know so which is the first exchange you connect to trade bitmax uh, it was bitmax then uh, bitmax. back in the <laughs> yeah i mean like the the people now well i mean uh, people now talk about the dominance of binance and how big it is and how big it was but bitmax back in the day when uh the perps were just you know starting to get adoption it was the whole market like certainly in terms of liquidity it was just you know head and shoulder above everyone else right. and so we um yeah we started there it was uh really really you know learning by doing uh, we were executing everything manually um, so it was a rather steep learning curve uh, and then the kind of who felt um, yeah compelled to really you know try to take it seriously and you know innovate uh, automate strategies and little by little we became uh, decently good and then better better and yeah started to compete in the HFT game okay so are you still trading half manual or half uh algo was now it's 100 percent algo yeah 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 so basically since 2021 so 
basically two years it took us uh, to, you know, uh, to switch uh, to uh, systematic strategies. It was always uh, the the dream, if you want, the goal, the target uh, for us to go, you know, fully systematic. Uh, but then, you know, when you start with very little, you've never done it. You don't know how to do it in the first place. It, it's always, you know, quite scary uh, to to leave the machine to do it. Uh, but then ultimately, you know, once you uh, start to build infrastructure when it's good enough and incrementally, you kind of, you know, build out uh, the the trust, sophistication, and say, you know, safe safekeeping. Uh, then it just becomes really, you know, the only way to do it. Um, so we certainly, you know, uh, yeah, now we just don't see it any other way other than you know, fully systematic. Yeah, I, I mean, five years ago when you first joined, it was when also, you know, 2018. Uh, that, that's kind of uh, when Bybit started. Uh, and um, um, well, we, we we kind of started in the end of 2017, and then um, the problem we were trying to solve was Bybit was initially also a perpetual contract exchange, <laughs> and uh, we were looking at Bitmax. They were um, a lot bigger than Binance dominance now. They were just like fucking king, right? And but the biggest issue was overload, and there was so much overload, and everyone was complaining on Twitter. Uh, the overload issue, and they made so many memes out of it. And so when we built Bybit, we were the one. We had one mission. Uh, it was to make an exchange that doesn't have overload. <laughs> so yeah. I, I remember when uh, the Bitmax was saying we don't have overload because we don't have the the volume. Um, I guess we proved them wrong in that, in that sense. <laughs> yeah, I guess in retrospect, uh, it's a bit clearer why they weren't so compelled to solve the overload problem, right? Given all this internal market maker uh, scandal that, you know, that followed. Um, but yeah, I mean, th that was the game, right? It's like whenever market was moving a bit more overload and you, you know, you sit there and like we certainly, you know, we're, you know, in the same camp as everyone else that it's, you know, it hurts everyone. But then, you know, what can you do? Uh, yeah. Eventually, yeah. they solved it. I'm curious because you know um, you guys been you you've been in five years um, and I think it's it's probably a crazy ride. Um, like over the five years, how would you describe the exchange infrastructure and and what kind of strategy you can deploy compared to before? Was there some limitations? Is it much better now overall? And, yeah. Uh, how is it to you? Yeah. Well, so the the funny thing is that like. Um, Depending what what you do and how sophisticated you are, you view the world uh, through a slightly different lens, right? Say uh, Bitmax case. Um, even if you were trading manually, you could see the challenge of the overload. It was you know hurting you. Um, but then some like more nuanced things, um, you kind of maybe glance over it. So you kind of weren't like fully uh, aware about some of the quirks of API. Uh, some of the issues uh, of you know trade confirmations over API uh, and you know and on and on and so I, I would say like we kind of as market matured we we also like improved uh, tons um, so we, in in the in the beginning it was wild west like uh, everyone had really bad infrastructure everything was very slow uh, and so on uh, but then. Um, kind of the, the better product, the better user experience, deeper liquidity, uh, and so on, which is a combination of like many things, right? Like um, um, the exchanges started to took off. So Binance uh, was definitely, you know, one of the biggest beneficiaries uh, yourselves, you know, OKX, uh, you know, Coinbase, Kraken, all of those guys were definitely, you know, iterating quite a bunch. Um, and so I think it's, it's became much more comprehensive ecosystem where you have, you know, margin trading, where you have portfolio margining, uh, where you have all sorts of, you know, lending, staking, uh, and, you know, more aggressive fees, uh, better um, rate limits, uh, and more, um, well, uh, institutions focused uh, API capabilities. So I think it's like, you know, back in the day, you could do a lot of these ARBs without any infrastructure, but now, you know, the deviations are so polished uh, like the, the, the big holes are, uh, patched, which is not to say that, you know, there is, there is nothing to do. It's just to say that you need to be like really, really, really good in terms of, you know, networking, in terms of, you know, 
strategies in terms of, you know, the whole um, infrastructure that you build to take advantage of, you know, arbitrage opportunities. Mm -hmm. So in turn of the, so basically you talk about there is a lot of technology advancements you've been um, see the market has been uh, adapting, right? So like, I, I kind of wonder like uh, in your current strategies, like do you, what role does like, you know, like data science, machine learning uh, that will play in your trading model, right? Like people talk about AI. Are you also think about adapting AI in your trading model? How do you see this technology gonna evolve eventually? Um, I think it's, um, so, so for ourselves, uh, we, we use um, some simple, uh, some simple stuff, uh, you know, of data science, uh, some some AI tools, but it's not like I wouldn't say that this is our biggest, you know, edge. Um, the way I kind of you know make analogy is that you know to succeed in crypto, it's not a uh, complex problem; it's a complicated problem. And the difference is that complex is uh, where you have a really challenging, you know, one equation that you need to solve, and, and um, you know, after you solve it, it's you know, you have a really strong advantage, defendable edge. Uh, it's more like you have 100 things uh, to take care of, uh, and each of them are maybe quite trivial, but then solving them uh, well uh, and, uh, you know, maintaining those solutions and evolving them, uh, given, you know, things change quite frequently, is is a, a, an actual edge. So I think, like, the, the modeling part is important, especially if you're looking at the market microstructure uh, and, you know, some like, you know, alpha signals and so on. Uh, and it's obviously, you know, very sensitive uh, to to the inputs. Um, and that's where like it opens the door to a lot of, uh, well, um, feature engineering a bit or, or just, you know, modeling, backtesting uh, and, and so on. Uh, but um, yeah, I think it's like not that many firms uh, have a lot of success with it. Uh, because, well, it, it's quite challenging and, and it also takes time, meaning uh, both infrastructure uh, costs uh, and, you know, actually, you know, creating these alphas, but also to compute it. And so if you're really playing in the high frequency trading game uh, where, you know, even one millisecond of computation makes a difference for you, um, then, you know, maybe that's that's not really something for you for you to do. So it's kind of, you know, it's always a spectrum. Uh, the 99% of things are quite easy to take care of, but then, you know, the final uh, percent is always, you know, the hardest uh, and requires a lot of, you know, um, the, the the build out and preparation and nurturing. Yeah, I mean, from from our from the exchange side, we see new players coming in and out, right? But we see that throughout Boo and Bears, um, the, the bigger players, of course, are there constantly trading. Um, you know, I think, you know, Eugene is from CME before. Um, if you look at traditional uh, places where the players is so in infrastructure heavy, you almost never hear new guys coming in, right? It's a few guys from Chicago and here and there, and that's it. But in crypto, do you believe infrastructure is, is really important uh, on, the, on, on the institution side? And do you believe, believe it's still like a blue ocean for new players to come in? or is already in extremely um, infrastructure heavy and, and it's hard for people to come in? Well, so I, I think I think in a world, um, it, it always happens uh, or almost always happens this way that um, some people that amass, you know, a lot of resources, they keep on getting bigger. Um, and the longer the, the, the competition goes, the, the more edge they have. Uh, just because you know they have you know better access better fees better infrastructure better you know resources and so it became becomes like a really defendable alpha um and so that's why like you see uh in some you know niche markets right uh, and you can segment it in whichever way in tradfi uh, and generalized even to like businesses oftentimes at the top you have you know just few companies uh, right like you know two three companies and you know in in trading in particular it kind of you know makes even like uh, a lot of sense because let's say um, at the given moment uh, absorbing all the information that there is out there, there is only one you know correct trade. 
you know, you need to either, you know, buy or sell uh, and in a particular size. And so if, if you are like the best guy, which means, you know, both infrastructure, uh, both, you know, algos uh, and, you know, personnel and on and on and on, it's like you're going to be taking good chunk of, of that best trade. Uh, it, it's still competitive, right? So maybe, you know, the split is between, you know, first, second and third guys, like, you know, 20, uh, 10, you know, and five uh, of, of this alpha. And then, you know, the rest is shared between, you know, the smaller guys. Um, but it's kind of, you know, it, it's a bit like that. And in crypto, I think um, it, it's, it's always uh, kind of net-net between the best uh, and, and the average that, that you kind of, you know, uh, worry about. If, if the best guys have uh, really, you know, some, some, uh, some really big advantage, uh, then you kind of don't want to compete with them in their own game. You kind of need to uh, appreciate that this is probably a lose uh, f for you um, and, you know, try to, uh, knowing that, uh, try something else. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that, you know, you, you could amass, you know, some resources and, and maybe, you know, challenge them uh, with a new approach. So I think um, to answer the, the initial question, uh, for now, infrastructure uh, plays a role. It's not um, kind of, you know, prohibitive uh, for, for the new players that may be looking for longer term uh, strategies uh, to, to participate because liquidity is good, commissions are okay. Um, so you can, uh, you know, still express views on the longer term, but short term uh, market microstructure and like structural alpha is kind of, you know, becoming really, really dominated uh, playground by, you know, call it, you know, five, 10 firms. Mm -hmm. I actually, I also want to uh, kind of elaborate a bit about what you just described, right? I mean, one thing is like from from Bybit, uh, from the day I, I joined Bybit to start an institution business, uh, we have a lot of internal discussions. Uh, but I think one thing very clear is like, we don't want to give any particular player certain very distinct uh, advantage. We would definitely encourage uh, level playing fields. Uh, so we got this, question asked by a lot of firms, right? It's like, do you have a colo? Do you offer colo service? And then and then we, we say no, a lot of people, they don't believe it, but we really don't offer colo service, colo clearing service to any institutions, because like, we want to make sure that like, it's a level playing field, right? So we, we, we want to make sure that everybody can find their edge, can find their uh, offer uh, when training on Bybit. That's what we try to promote when we, especially when we uh, try to develop our institution business on Bybit. Okay, yeah. so, yeah. Going back to, you know, I, uh, I'm, I'm just curious uh, on a few things. Um, you know, everyone, when, that, when they interview me, they ask me, how does regulation play a role on the exchange, right? And I'm also wondering, how is the regulation play in the institution side. I understand you guys are, of course, FCA regulated and all that, but because the evolving uh, strategy and, and the exchange landscape changes because of regulation and all that, do you see uh, a difference now after FTX, after FEC, and does it affect your strategy either on Binance or on different other exchanges to be more careful or I, I don't know, is that play a rule in your mentality for, for trading and all that? Um, well, so that's where like the, um, the different teams uh, and resources of a larger organization come into picture. So uh, we have um, yeah, a lot of people in the legal team that are talking to the regulator, following the latest uh, legislations and uh, yeah, um, guiding us on, on what can we access and what we can't. Um, but, you know, for sure, like the, the, the pace uh, intensified uh, post FTX. Uh, there, there has been quite substantial loss of assets um, for, by the retail participants and well, and institutions as well. Um, so this is just a, a clear case of uh, under regulation, uh, and many exchanges are kind of operating in this uh, gray area, uh, and you know perhaps um, doing something that they shouldn't be doing uh, to uh, get that you know uh, head start. Um, or at least you not know, to start try to catch up with the uh, leading um, uh, exchanges. So for us, uh, regulation is obviously very important. Um, and yeah, it's 
we would want it to be really clear uh, and coherent. Um, but yeah, it's not not necessarily uh, the case as of now. Um, All right. Yeah, I assume you might see players come and go uh, also because of the regulation and all, the, <clears throat> all these rules that's been implemented. Yeah. Mm. Yep. So, so the last podcast we actually talked to uh, Michael and Simon from the from Copper the Care Loop. Um, so, I mean, Fasanara actually is also the one uh, driver, like main driver, why we want to integrate with the Care Loop, right? And then you actually also the early users. Uh, once the Bybees uh, go live with the clear loop. So uh, I wonder right now is like, you know, uh, integrating integrating with a third party custodian provider, is that something that uh, on your must have list when you consider to trading uh, on exchanges today? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, it's, it's really, really important and it's, uh, it serves uh, two purposes. Uh, one is that, and you know, above all, is that uh, your assets are safe. Uh, so um, exchanges um, don't really need to uh, take ownership of your assets and like you know, absorb them into your bal into their balance sheet. Um, they they shouldn't be a custodian. Obviously, uh, legacy um, uh, played a role. Uh, how it came to be that you know banking rails weren't available for vast majority of them. And so, you know, BitMaxes of the world, you know, pioneered all these perps, which were, you know, navigating with this, you know, Bitcoin and uh, sat all, all in Bitcoin. You don't need any intermediaries and all that. But um, now that the, the, the play field is um, really institutionalizing and there are more and more uh, advanced participants coming into the picture that have really strong uh, requirements in terms of uh, the way they want to interact with the market. And, and for them, um, it, it's, it's just a bit unheard of uh, to just, you know, depositing um, money into uh, this, you know, offshore companies with very light regulation and um, very little uh, clarity on, on uh, how they do it, what they do, which is obviously, you know, um, there are um, clearly, you know, different, different uh, exchanges and some of them are, you know, are... Uh, much more robust than others, much more transparent than others, uh, much more regulated than others. Uh, so it's a spectrum, but uh, out of the box, you kind of uh, don't gain anything, uh, but then you potentially expose yourself to the FTX scenario. Um, so it's having um, this clear segregation of assets is really, really important. I think in the post FTX world uh, for the institutional players, uh, and so having a third party custodians, be it, you know, qualified, not qualified, but just having an option uh, to do it is really uh, important. Uh, certainly uh, the, the feedback uh, from the investors that we talk to, um, for them, like the, the biggest risk of the asset class, uh, like for strategies like ours, is just the credit risk, which, which is um, exactly what we say to them is that, uh, well, uh, the... The, the strategies have very little market risk, but then they have, uh, uh, well, non-trivial uh, credit risk. And so having uh, some of these mitigation uh, procedures in place uh, is, is really, really uh, on top of our list when we're evaluating exchanges. Uh, because um, at, this, at this moment, um, two out of three largest exchanges, uh, they, uh, they already have uh, solutions like that in place. Uh, and so it, it's really good that, that you guys uh, got it. Um, and, and, and effectively, um, like a smaller exchange to try to um, win over uh, new customers without that in place, it's kind of becomes progressively harder sell uh, in our experience. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like uh, asked not only from your internal risk management perspective, it's also asked for your external investor have similar requests, right? Just make sure like they have a yeah, yeah, yeah. increased trust. Yeah, definitely. So, um, yeah. But so other than that, what do you think that, you know, will should be on a must have list, you know, for for exchanges in the futures? Um, well, so it obviously um, there are a lot of dimensions, uh, but when we evaluate an exchange, um, so we, um, 
we think about it uh, through through many lenses. So one is uh, regulatory. Uh, let's just you know lab, label that back at that. Uh, like what licenses they have, uh, where they are based, where they are regulated. So kind of those like really simple things uh, to well uh, to evaluate uh, that are you know, relatively transparent. Then the second box, which I guess is more interesting given the nature of the podcast, is um, um, well fees, uh, the um, where the servers are, uh, how the how well uh, documented the, the API. Uh, is e whether the collocation is available, uh, the ease of, uh, well, uh, getting some credit lines uh, and uh, how competitive the exchange is. Because, you know, in, in some exchanges, there is, you know, quite a lot of um, certain, you know, benefits uh, and and certain, you know, trade-offs uh, in, in terms of, well, toxicity of the flow. So some guys really um, are, you know, toxic and some exchanges are, you know, uh, putting some procedure in place uh, to make it a, a bit more a favorable environment. So it, it kind of goes, you know, uh, in, into a lot of details. Uh, obviously, margining is extremely important uh, and a size of the exchange in terms of, you know, open interest, volumes, uh, and the sheer uh, variety of uh, different participants also plays a role. Um, but I, th I think um, going forward, it will be, Really important to ha to be very compliant uh, regulatory wise. Uh, have a diverse group of participants involved. Uh, having some of these uh, off exchange settlement solutions uh, and really good technology. Uh, I think these are you know, some of the things that we think uh, and we want to see. Okay. Yeah, because I, I th you guys been trading uh, on Bybit almost for two years. I think start trading the about like may june uh 2021 right and then i see your volume has been growing right i guess we must do something right that's why you've been increasing volume on us right so for your experience what do you think like uh kind of set by being apart from other exchanges for your experience well, i i i think uh, you you guys obviously um are doing many things you know the right way in terms of um, yeah, just designing the user experience. Uh, I think you add in uh, this portfolio margining uh, is is really uh, good uh, good help uh, because um, yeah, like it it's it eases the operation uh, for the market maker uh, quite quite a lot. Um, then uh, I think um, yeah, the the fee schedule obviously you know uh, plays a role. Uh, and um, some just, just kind of, I, I guess, the, the presence uh, of diverse crowd of, of participants rather than, you know, uh, five top market makers trading against them, themselves uh, and, you know, trying to break even on that. Um, so it, there is quite a lot of things uh, and your spot market, obviously, uh, is relatively new uh, and you know, it, it matured quite a bit. And now it's, you know, quite large at the global scale. Uh, and so uh, the, the perps have quite a lot of liquidity um, and both kind of active uh, and, and passive. Um, so it's, you know, you've definitely uh, did a lot of uh, good things uh, to, to grow the exchange and uh, yeah. Thank you. And so Nikita, so we uh, happening from the exchange side, uh, whether it's us or any or the industry, something you guys like to see happening or? Well, uh, I think it's less so from the exchange side. It's more like just diversity of uh, market participants because yeah. it, it just used to be that, you know, and it still largely remains the same, just maybe proportions changed a little. Uh, so you have a sleeve of this uh, really uh, you know, smart sharks, uh, market uh, market makers, and then you have you know retailers. So like click traders, you know, and there are a lot of them. So they still represent large uh, large uh, size and and volume. Um, but you kind of want to have some some guys in the middle uh, that that really you know think about maybe not you know milliseconds time horizon, but maybe think about you know hours to days. Um, so that they kind of you know correct the prices on a you know different um, yeah different time time frame, um, and I think that would kind of um, make it um, a bit more complete 
uh, rather than you have you know this uh, bipolar um, yeah operation. But yeah, other than that, just um, I, I mean just more more uh, liquidity, more trading, uh, better user experience. Um, I think those are some of the immediate things that come to mind. So and look at that. So you have been trading cryptos or investing in crypto for almost five years, right? So would you mind to share what's your best trade or best investment in crypto? And what's the worst trade, what's the investment in crypto in the last five years? <laughs> well, so I mean we don't really um the per you can really... talk about personal. You, you don't you don't have to speak for the front, you can you can just speak for yourself. Yeah. I mean, um, we don't really take you know the directional views, uh, but you know, personally, obviously, you know, we have some um, some interest in the space. Um, the, the the best one, uh, I mean, there were a couple of NFTs uh, that did really really well. Um, so I was just a bit lucky with a few of those um, that kind of you know took off and um, in the end became uh, quite 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 big success. Uh, I mean, worst trades. I mean, there are quite a lot of them. To be honest, um, in general, crypto uh, draw down quite a lot uh, from the uh, from the peaks, so it's it's not difficult to find uh, a lot of um, yeah a lot of trades labeled like that. Um, I, I, maybe I'll just answer a slightly different uh, question, which is uh, like, what was the most memorable day? And like for me, March twelfth, twenty twenty, that was uh, for sure like uh, hard to beat. Uh, and like to remind those who weren't too active then, it was uh, when Bitcoin dropped like 50% within a day. So there were, and there were like a lot of troubles with BitMEX. It was, you know, uh, quite likely that it would go down. And so there it, it could have been really, really bad, but then in the end it was very good for us. Um, so this was kind of, you know, uh, one of the more memorable moments. Well, Ben, what's your most memorable memorable days in cryptos in your careers? <laughs> um, well, I think the FTX week was exciting. I think I hardly got any sleep from the exchange operator side because everyone is panicking, everyone's withdrawing, and um, I think at that point all you can do is to make sure they can withdraw fast. So and and like literally that whole week. Uh, I was on Twitter answering like all the concerns, all the fun that happened because everyone lost trust to the exchange. Yeah, but then they it rebounded. But uh, that whole week was just uh, quite intense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was uh, probably on par with March twelfth, twenty twenty, for yeah. us. Yeah. No, nobody saw that was coming. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, indeed, indeed. Okay. I mean, I think like last time we spoke, right, Nikita, before uh, prepare for this podcast, you, you also have questions you want to ask, Ben? Uh, yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. Um, I had one question. So, uh, obviously, uh, Bybit um, grew tremendously um, over the past few years. Uh, you did uh, very well for yourself and uh, for, for the company. And uh, I'm just curious, um, what what kind of uh, keeps you going? Like, what's the larger um, vision that that you have for the company and for yourself personal? Kind of what keeps you motivated and excited uh, to do more? Um, yeah. So the, the the very honest answer was, uh, I think the motivation is just trying trying to be useful uh, as for myself, right? Why I get up? Why I, I think. Uh, a lot of people say, hey, what's your life goal, life achievement? But these things are very, once you get it, it's, it's, you just keep going for more, right? So at the end of the day, I think the ultimate life goal is just to be useful. And it, it feels pretty good to, um, you know, uh, help the people in the office around us to, to, to make the decisions to, to move things. I think, I think that's kind of the typical builder's mentality. As for Bybit, I think we, we try to be the the gateway to crypto or to blockchain or Web3, whatever you call it. So we see ourselves as, uh, I think, exchange mm, had actually taken too much spotlights uh, in, in, before or, or, or um, in the industry uh, that 
I, I think exchange should be infrastructure. When you talk about infrastructure, you think about railways, you think about road and bridges. And, and in, when you get to places, you don't really think about the road. It's just there. It helps you to get there. But you think about it when it, when it has a problem. But when it's smooth, it should be invisible, right? And I think the role of exchange is to be as much invisible as possible, that we should provide a good, solid service. Uh, and when the client needs us, we're there. And we're always there. But we shouldn't be taking the center stage of the whole industry uh, because the whole industry is about decentralization, is about Web3 and all the innovation that comes with it. We are just transporting people there. As a centralized exchange, there are a lot of things we simply cannot deliver, right? We're, just, we're centralized. So I think uh, this is what Bible is trying to strive to be, is, is the best bridge, the best infrastructure, and get to people where they want to be. Uh, and sometimes maybe help them to filter out the scams, you know? So we call ourselves the ARC, the crypto ARC, because there are still a lot of scams going on. So, you, so we want to be the transportation, but at the same time, uh, uh, filter out some of the scam for, for the clients because they get lost and all that. Um, but yeah, so that, that's kind of the key philosophy and that's how the, the firm has been operating. Uh, it's just trying to be low key and trying to build the product and, and the service. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. How about yourself, Nikita? Because like right now, I mean, you actually, right, at your late 20, you already manage a quite sizable uh, hedge fund, right? So what's your goal in the future? Right? You want to bring manage a billion funds or you have a, other, you know, dream to accomplish in the crypto space? Well, maybe not crypto space. Yeah, I mean, so right now our immediate goal is to become as good as we can uh, in, in market making and, uh, you know, HFT, those kind of things. So we set ourselves to be just, you know, de facto, um, you know, the best uh, crypto funds that, that uh, in, in the space. Um, so that's kind of what we want to achieve. Uh, and so uh, kind of my goal is to, you know, to make it happen. Uh, and so we want to uh, then um, kind of uh, diversify and like, you know, um, become, um, yeah, much more of a contributor uh, to the space, which we're uh, trying uh, in and out anyways. Um, but we kind of want to be, yeah, this um, gateway uh, as well uh, into the uh, for institutional cap capital into the space. And then what we want to do is uh, is to really become uh, create uh, some um, well some product uh, that will be used uh, by the industry and that could uh, help advance the adoption of the asset class. Um, so it's kind of a multi, multi-step, um, um, idea, uh, but it, it kind of, uh, all, all starts, uh, with, yeah, just becoming a, as effective investor as possible, um, in, in the, um, yeah, in the short term, but then eventually, uh, to become a builder, uh, ourselves, uh, and yeah, just really, uh, push, push forward. Yeah. I mean, last time when we met in Amsterdam, right. You also mentioned that you've been recently really got into the F1, right? So yeah. sponsor uh, F1 team, would that be also in your plan? <laughs> well, I, I mean, it could be maybe even more than that. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I think it's why, like, why? Huh? go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think it's just like uh, with these things, it's very difficult to extrapolate uh, and um, my my guiding principle is that you know if every every you know few months you look back and you just should be saying to yourself like wow like i can do now what i, I just couldn't even think i you know i could uh you know a few months ago and this is kind of you know across uh, all all sorts of you know dimensions uh just you know access uh, or you know um depths of thinking uh, or just you know capabilities um infrastructure wise or trading wise or whatever else and um, so I think it's, you know, uh, the goal is to be uh, impactful and to make the difference. Um, but uh, yeah, kind of, you know, um, in terms of like more, um, yeah, more precise things, uh, the way I'm kind of thinking about it is that 
once uh, it, I get closer, I'll be make, able to make a much better judgment of our, um, relevance of, of these things. Because as you kind of think about it conceptually, many of things you know feel right, but then when you get into the position um, to actually you know take it, do it, uh, execute on it, then maybe you just you know different person by then, and you just you know it, it's no longer relevant. Um, so it's kind of you know having the grand vision. Uh, in mind uh, at all times, but then also not being lost in the you know small day-to-day -day incremental improvements. Cool. Very good. Okay. Shall we? I think that's it, right? Yeah. Let's wrap it up. Right. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. yeah okay. Thank you, Nikita. Thank you very much. Yeah, and we look forward to seeing you uh, again soon. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, great talking to you guys. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, guys.